Hi, this is Corey Franklin with Remembering People Past, the story of people who've died recently who've had a major impact on history, society, or culture. And tonight we're going to start out with a golfer. We're going to start out with Severiano Sevi Ballesteros, the greatest golfer ever from Spain. Since World War II, the two greatest golfers of the modern era were Jack Nicklaus in the mid to late 60s and early 70s and Tiger Woods in the 90s and early 2000s. So there was an interval between them, and in that interval there were a number of golfers who could lay claim to being the greatest golfer in the world, and Severiano Ballesteros was one of them. Sebi Ballesteros won three British Opens, won the Masters twice, including at the time in 1980 being the youngest man ever to win the Masters and the first European to ever win the Masters. European meaning non-British. He was the number one rated golfer in the world for over a year in the 80s. But it's not his record as a golfer that stands out. It's his style. Seve Ballesteros played like a matador. He was flashy. He was flamboyant. He played to the crowd. There was nobody else like him. The closest person to him would probably be Arnold Palmer. The crowds loved him because of his character and his personality. He was literally the matador of golf. He was like a bullfighter. The British especially loved him because he popularized golf on the mainland and he helped the British and the Europeans defeat the Americans in the Ryder Cup when they teamed together. Sebi Ballesteros died recently, too young at the age of 54, and here's a BBC report on him. He was dashing. By Joe, he's really leathered that with an iron. Charismatic and always played with a smile on his face. Show us your choppers again, Sevi. It's nice to see you smile. Sevi Ballesteros rarely followed the textbook, but his style lit up a sport which back then could seem a bit grey. His unconventional style probably had something to do with the fact that, as a boy, he taught himself to play on a beach next to his house. He's let a breath of youthful fresh air into this championship. But self-taught or not... He soon became one of golf's brightest talents, taking the Open by storm as a teenager at Royal Birkdale in the mid-70s. He soon became the game's star attraction, not necessarily for his technique, but for his sheer audacity and panache. He could be wild, but when in trouble, could produce moments of magic other players could only dream of. Well, he brought a, a, a joie de vivre to the game. He was, uh, he was handsome, he was young, he was 18, 19, 20, 21. And golf was considered by many to be a fuddy-duddy old pedestrian game. And here was this young fella, ooh, doing wondrous things. He was like a rapier against the broadsword. That's the British for you, a rapier against the broadsword. His first Open title was won to huge acclaim in 1979. Two more were to follow, plus two US Masters titles. And when injury cut his playing career short, he confirmed his importance to European golf by inspiring Ryder Cup glory against the United States in 1997. In one tournament, he actually made a shot from his knees. He was behind a tree, and he hit a shot from his knees. That's the kind of guy Seve Ballesteros was. Here's Johnny Miller, who was the best American of that time, the challenger to Seve Ballesteros, talking about what a great golfer he was. He was very exciting. I mean, if Seve Ballesteros came on the scene now, I think he'd be at least equal in popularity to Woods, maybe even more popular than Woods because of his expressions and his follow-throughs and, you know, the, you know, all the crazy stuff and all the things that Seve used to do and the way he played. I, I, it's just amazing to me how fast people have forgotten how big of a star he was. And what a player. Trust me when I tell you that Johnny Miller doesn't hand out compliments easily to fellow golfers, so that was a big deal. Here's a little more from the BBC. Just so you know, the Open they refer to as the British Open. Seve first overcame the Open at Royal Lytham St Anne's in 1979. En route to a thrilling victory, he displayed the bravery of a matador. Uninhibited, unrestrained, and the galleries loved him for it. Five years later, at St Andrews, his final green celebrations produced one of the most iconic images in the game of golf. 
Seve had become a global star with a game that left his rivals awestruck. The true swashbuckling, you know, he just had that presence. He stood up on the tees and he just crashed it anywhere and raced after it and crashed it again and gets to the green and in the hole. You know, he had a different style of playing. There simply aren't people who play the game now as Seve did. The individuality that made him, it gave him a, a bump of irreverence for what is me against the world. And that's what drove him on. I think many of those things that he had are completely missing from players now. Since Tiger Woods has had his personal problems, there really isn't another golfer with the flair or panache of Seve Ballesteros. There are plenty of great golfers in the world, but there are not a lot of great golf personalities and we will miss Sebi Ballesteros. I'd like to do a couple of brief tributes. First one is to Jackie Cooper, who was probably a Hollywood star as long as anyone. He was a child star. He made his name with Wallace Beery in The Champ in the early 30s. There's a brief clip when he was about 10 years old. Do you like fairy tales? No. Have you read the one about the Sleeping Beauty? Uh-uh. It's about a princess that slept a thousand years. That's a lot of hooey. How could anyone sleep a thousand years? It's only a fairy tale. I'll say it is. And all the time she was sleeping, didn't she ever eat? It doesn't say anything about that. Did you ever try going without breakfast? Try it sometime and see how empty you get. And this princess goes for a thousand years without even eating a sandwich. Wish more. Here he is in an underrated TV sitcom from the 50s called The People's Choice, where his co-star was a cute basset hound named Cleo. You're with us for The People's Choice. That's Mayor People's House. And for the next 30 minutes, you're going to see how love makes the world go around with a sickly expression. Quiet, Cleo. Lately, she's been grouchy. She always barks. That's me, Johnny Mark. The People's Choice. Starring Jackie Cooper. Here he is more than 50 years on from the champ in the Christopher Reeves series of Superman as newspaper editor Perry White, where he's actually very good. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. Why? Olson, why am I paying you $40 a week when I should have you arrested for loitering? Go get Mr. Kent. No, That's how. Move, get move. Right, Chief. I make mine black and no sugar. Right, Chief. And don't call me sugar. Oh, why don't you take Kent out to uh, meet everybody, huh? Sure. Just introduce him around. Yeah. He's starting with the paper today. Thank I'm giving him the city beat. Uh, Gee, that's my beat. No, Clark Kent may seem like just a mild-mannered reporter, but listen, not only does he know how to treat his editor-in-chief with the proper respect, not only does he have a snappy, punchy prose style, but he is, in my 40 years in this business, the fastest typist I've ever seen. Jackie Cooper, longtime Hollywood star. Nobody did it longer. also want to acknowledge the passing of William Campbell, who was a B-actor on television, who had a couple of memorable roles in Star Trek. Here he is as Trelane in The Squire of Gothos. No! No! This has gone far enough. You always stop me when I'm having fun. Time to come in now, Trelane. But I don't want to come in and I won't. I'm a general and I won't listen to you. Enough, Trelane. Come along. But why? I didn't do anything wrong. I was just playing. We said, come along. But I haven't finished studying my predators yet. This is not studying them. If you cannot take proper care of your pets, you cannot have them at all. But I was winning. I was winning. No. Okay, we're not talking Olivier there, obviously. But the main reason we mention William Campbell is for his historical import. For about four years, he was married to a lady named Judith Exner. Judith Exner divorced William Campbell. She became Judith Exner Campbell. And she became a girlfriend to President John Kennedy while he was in office. She was a gorgeous girl, and she was probably introduced to President Kennedy by Frank Sinatra. At the same time, she was also the girlfriend of Sam Giancana, who was the head of the Chicago mob. So there was a mafia White House connection. Judith Exner talked about that a lot in her later years, and it was one of the Kennedy scandals that was covered up. William Campbell is notable only because Judith Exner took her married name from when she was married to him in the 50s before JFK became president. 
We're certainly not mentioning him because of his acting. Finally, a brief mention of Herbert Schlafly, the man who invented the teleprompter. And I'm going to let Al Jazeera TV tell you a little bit about him. Finally, we mark the death of the inventor of a revolutionary piece of television equipment. It is something you at home very rarely see because I'm the one looking at it right now. It's this, the teleprompter or the auto cue, as it's sometimes known, invented by one Hubert Schlafly, an engineer for 20th Century Fox. He was approached by a soap opera actor who was struggling to remember his lines. Uh, this was back in the 1950s. What he came up with was a monitor facing the person appearing on screen, rolling the script through at reading speed. The device has become, well, <laughs> when it works, it's become a staple of modern broadcasting, rescuing decades of actors, politicians, and maybe even newscasters from embarrassment on live TV. Well, the teleprompter was critical for the development of television because it minimized the use of cue cards so actors didn't have to go to cue cards to know their lines. The first real use of the teleprompter on television was by who else? Lucy and Desi. Lucy used it in a couple of episodes, including Vitamita Vegemin, which we played when we did our report on Madeline Pugh Davis. Again, recurring theme, Lucy and Desi as television pioneers. When Ted Turner was developing CNN, he really thought a lot of the teleprompter, and it was critical in the development and expansion of CNN. The first president to use the teleprompter was Herbert Hoover, not while he was president, but 20 years later when he was the ex-president in 1952 at the Republican National Convention. His teleprompter failed, by the way. It's safe to say that President Obama today would have a lot of trouble if he didn't have the teleprompter. So I'm sure President Obama would join us in thanking Herbert Schlafly for his invention of the teleprompter, which revolutionized television and, to a certain extent, politics. Our final profile tonight is of Arthur Lawrence, who died in his 90s. He was the prolific producer, screenwriter, and playwright on Broadway. Arthur Lawrence was a nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn, Erasmus Hall High School. And when he came out of the Navy, he wrote his first script for a movie for The Snake Pit, which was a post-World War II film noir with Olivia de Havilland. After that, he got his first big break when he caught the eye of Alfred Hitchcock, who asked him to write the screenplay for his movie Rope. And we've talked about Rope when we talked about Farley Granger. It's a movie based on the Leopold and Loeb case, starring Farley Granger, John Dahl, and Jimmy Stewart. Two young men murder one of their friends, put him in a trunk, and decide to have a party in the room with the trunk, right after the murder. It's a Hitchcock classic, and here is Arthur Lawrence talking about it. I had been working on the screenplay for The Snake Pit, which was getting a lot of attention in Hollywood. And I think that brought me to Hitch's attention. I think the real reason was he wanted a playwright, because this is essentially a play, and done as a play. So he came to me. I liked the idea of working with him, and we got along very well. It was very easy, really. Rope really comes from an English play by Patrick Hamilton called Rope's End. I thought it was going to be easier than it was to make an American. The trouble was when you translated the English dialogue, it became very homosexual, unintentionally. And also the class system, very different in England than here. So it called for more changes than I anticipated. What was curious to me was rope is obviously about homosexuals. The word was never mentioned. Not by Hitch, not by anybody at Warner's where it was filmed. It was referred to as it. They were going to do a picture about it and the actors were it. You frightened me. You always have. From that very first day in prep school. Part of your charm, I suppose picture was much more successful in Europe because I suppose in Europe they were used to it and we weren't here. And they didn't deny, but they never discussed that it was based on the Loeb Leopold case. They ignored it. I couldn't understand that. Two rich boys in a Chicago school decided to murder a third boy for the thrill of it. And I mentioned it and everybody looked blank and went on with whatever we were talking about. But it obviously came from that. At that time, because of a thing called the Legion of Decency in the Catholic Church, they had a watchdog, censors. And you had to be careful. There were certain rules. If a man and a woman were on the same bed, one of them had to have his or her feet on the floor. A married couple could not sleep in the same bed. A woman couldn't ask a man for a divorce. The man had to say, I know you want a divorce. With rope, of course, you could never say that they 
were it. So there was no mention of it in the picture at all. I wish we had him out of here. I wish it was somebody else. It's a trifle late for that, don't you think? Uh, whom would you have preferred? Kenneth? Oh, I don't know. I suppose anyone was as good or as bad as any other. You, perhaps. I'm frightened anymore, are you, Philip? You can't have fear, you know. Neither of us can. That's the difference between us and the ordinary man, Philip. They talk about committing the perfect crime, but nobody does it. Nobody commits a murder yeah. just for the experiment of committing it. Nobody except us. That bears a curious resemblance to champagne. It is. That's uh, very good champagne, too. What's the occasion? You always did stutter when you were excited. Well, I guess I'm always excited when I give a party. Really? In Rope, you have a teacher who was also supposed to be homosexual. I smile because Hitch wanted Cary Grant for that part, Monty Cliff, Montgomery Cliff, for one of the boys. And according to what he told me, they both turned it down because they didn't want to be identified with it. But the intention was that this teacher had influenced these boys with Nietzsche's philosophy of the Superman. And he also had an affair with one of them. Now, you don't really approve of murder, Rupert, if I may. You may, and I do. Think of the problems it would solve. Unemployment, poverty, standing in line for theater tickets. Well, Jimmy Stewart never had an affair with anyone. He was just a Boy Scout. So the picture was curiously off focus and didn't have the sexual center that it should have. He was very good as a detective, but he had no relation to those boys at all. I don't know about what he wanted. I just know that perhaps because I came from the theater, every character is important. And I guess in movies, they weren't used to that anyway. Rope doesn't have a very large cast, and I thought it was really important that every character be a character. After that, Arthur Lawrence went back to the theater for the crowning glory of his career. It was originally supposed to be a play about the east side of New York and a Catholic girl and a Jewish boy, but times had changed. So it was changed into a story about the west side of New York and a Puerto Rican girl and a Polish boy in a musical retelling of Romeo and Juliet. That's right, West Side Story. One of the best staging moments in all of musical theater is when Tony and Maria see each other in the dance hall. It's very hard to explain because it's so visual. At either side of the stage, one side is Tony, one side is Maria clapping the others, and they look up and they see each other. And as they start to move across the stage together, the other dancers recede into the background. As I'm telling you this, my skin begins to tingle. It was incredible. I think West Side Story, to me, its big influence was that it said anything can be a musical because here it dealt with rape, with murder, bigotry, with violence, you know, all sorts of subjects that were considered taboo. Unexpectedly, they went insane. They loved it. Our ambition was to do something that we thought was good. That was it. And I think that's the only ambition one should have. When shrewdness sets in, you're in trouble. Here's a little bit of the song from the scene Arthur Lawrence describes from West Side Story. It's the best song in the show for my money, and this is the best version. It's not from the show itself, but I believe it is the best version by Johnny Mathis. Maria, I've just met a girl named Maria, and suddenly that name will never be the same to me. Arthur Lawrence was involved with the remake of West Side Story that was done a couple years ago in the 2000s. I saw that one. Uh, but back in the 50s, when West Side Story was completed, he went on to another huge musical. What it did for my career came into play really was Gypsy, because that was the next thing I did after West Side. And they hailed the book of that in no uncertain terms. So many people whom I really respect have said this made them think the theater is worth it. 
And that's an accomplishment, and I'm very proud of that. Gypsy was the story of Gypsy Rose Lee, and even more importantly, her mama, Mama Rose. Ethel Merman did a great job in it. I'm going to play a little one of the songs from Gypsy. It's not actually from the musical. It's a sort of a jazz version by a group called We Five. And We Five was famous for a hit in 1965 called You Were On My Mind. This is the flip side of it. They were a San Francisco group. They put a little Dave group back into it. But this song is from Gypsy, and it's one of the most beautiful songs in that great show. Funny, you're a stranger who's come here, come from another town. Funny, I'm a stranger myself in this small world. Oh, and funny. And I. After Gypsy and West Side Story, Arthur Lawrence went on to do many other projects, but those were his most significant ones. Near the end of his life, he summed up his work thusly. In the end, time's what tells. And I don't think you can value how good it is, but if you're proud of it. We're going to close on that note. I'd like to say thank you to my producer, Sid Tepps. And we're going to close with a song from the last great film that Arthur Lawrence wrote, The Way We Were, from 1973. He often said that he modeled the Barbara Streisand character after himself. Uh, he was called before the House on american Activities Committee in the 50s. That's what the story is sort of about. And the song, of course, is one of the great ones that uh, Barbara Streisand did, one of the last really great ones where I don't think she ever sang, written by Alan and Marilyn Bergman for the film, The Way We Were. So in tribute to Arthur Lawrence, here is that song. Memories like the corners of my mind Misty watercolor memories of the 